Number 10, Gucci to the socks. Man of Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is however difficult to place an exact number on his wealth, as this was a very long time ago, and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However, in his travels in hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, impaled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vladdy did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit, and when he asked them to remove their hats, as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. The east becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria, which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. Number seven, off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. I could think of some nasty other stuff too. I know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants, especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course, you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with, which funny enough might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also, not to mention his food was fresh, or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? 
Number 6. The Cowardly Lion Richard I was the King of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades. After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps, which actually was common for the time. Sadly, Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3,000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. At number five, we have hunting royal game. This goes for hunting the king's deer and catching the king's fish. It started with the deer in the late 11th century. What made it more difficult was after the conquests of England, a lot of local land was deemed royal land and locals were not allowed to hunt on it and would be punished if they took one of the king's deer. The punishment for this was to be blinded or worse. It was repealed in the early 12th century. As for the fish, the laws were put in place in the 13th century and were never abolished. Except it was slightly different. There was no set punishment for catching the whales and sturgeons, but if they were washed up on shore, they were to be offered to the monarchs first before the locals were allowed to have it. Nowadays, it makes no sense because many other laws in place override it. But in 2004, a Welsh fisherman caught a sturgeon and offered it to the queen. Just an interesting fun fact for you. At number four, we have having your tongue removed. Some people like to spread rumors or talk trash behind others' backs, or even make up things for theatrical effect. Well, in the Dark Ages, you could have your tongue removed from your mouth for spreading misinformation or using the Lord's name in vain. The church viewed blasphemy as a very severe crime, considering the church ruled just about everything alongside the monarchs at the time. So if you were caught spreading a belief that did not align with the church, you would be punished. So removing the tongue would leave the convict mute for the rest of their lives. Therefore, sufficing for the crimes. They would also be stoned or left in rope for the crimes depending on how long they were committing said blasphemy, as well as the context of the information. Just another example of medieval control tactics which in today's world make no sense. At number three, we have de what was deemed indecent dress. In the mid 14th century, wearing long and overly pointy shoes that were longer depending on your social status and could extend up to five inches off the foot, as well as eccentric and flamboyant tunics were considered illegal for the lower class. How did this come to be? As the fashion trends began to become popular amongst peasants, the crown stepped in, saying they were no longer allowed to participate in the fashion trends. This was to preserve the rich and famous image and how only the wealthy were allowed to wear such extravagant clothing. It was deemed that no townsfolk with a rank lower than a knight or a noble was allowed to wear shoes with spikes or a toe that extended more than two inches. And the same went for top clothing. No local was allowed to wear clothing that was deemed indecent and it had to cover most of them, whereas lords, nobles, and royalty were allowed to wear clothing that was far more revealing. It makes no sense because it was another excuse to separate people. Thankfully, it was repealed in the early 16th century and people were allowed to dress as they deemed necessary because putting a cap on a shoe length is just silly. At number two, we have the amount that was punishable by offing. In the Dark Ages, just about any crime was severe enough that you could lose your life over it. It was also far harder for women because they had to be far more cautious about what they say, how they acted, and what they knew. There was a lot of women who were stoned or burned for having moles that were deemed too large to be human, or for having birthmarks that were immediately noticeable. They would also be offed for being able to read, being able to understand math, being old and having a cat, and simply existing because they were witches and they were the reason the entire town was down on their luck. And that's just women. Talking back to royalty was punishable by meeting the end, and a lot of their methods to get people to confess or regret their crimes led to meeting their very unfortunate demise. It was really unethical and doesn't really make much sense in the grand scheme of things. And last but not least at number one, we have playing tennis and soccer was forbidden. Football or soccer was banned in the late 13th century because it was deemed to be too violent, considering fatalities while playing was a common occurrence. The games would get very aggressive and would often break out in fights as well, which while that aspect 
aspect is similar to today's soccer, it was very different from the soccer slash football we know today. It was originally banned in England in order to keep the peace while Edward II was in Scotland. Then it was banned nationally towards the end of the 13th century. As an alternative, the locals were encouraged to practice archery, so they had some sort of method of defense when other countries would attempt to invade. If you were caught playing football, you spent six days in prison for the crime, but that would be the extent of the punishment. As for tennis, in the late 14th century, it became illegal for any man who wasn't a noble of some sort to play tennis because it was deemed a royal sport, and it encouraged gambling amongst lower class citizens and caused men to slack off their work, which was a problem. The law was once again put in place to separate the lower class from the upper class, and the only exception to the law was Christmas, when regular people were allowed to play tennis with the nobles. Thankfully, both of these laws were repealed in the 18th century, and the sports were once again encouraged. Number 10, property. It should be no surprise to anyone watching this today, but women's rights and the treatment of women was not everyone's priority in the medieval ages. Dudes were just mean, I'm sorry. Where did it all stem from? I'm not sure, I'm just a guy with blue eyes, and sometimes I say funny stuff. But what I do know is that women were treated more like men's property, which is, that's, that's, that sucks, that's gross, no one likes that. Which they are not, thank you very much. Sometimes women were traded, like currency for livestock animals, land, and just business dealings in general, because women didn't have a say in the matter. Like, I'll give you two goats for my daughter, here you go, dude, which is just, that's not a fair deal, dude. That's that's not a trade, man. Not a trade. Number nine, promising young woman. Remember when I said if I talk about medieval times, I was gonna bring this up? It's a classic, a medieval staple. Couldn't couldn't talk about medieval times without it, really. What am I getting at? Well, that's marrying a woman in her midlife, about about 12 years old. Yeah, I know. It's gross. Deplorable, despicable, naughty, and just unsavory. Okay, so people only lived to their mid-30s and 40s back then, so time is of the essence. Sure, I get it, but come on, man. I am hereby banning any cradle robbing or diaper sniping. That includes the dudes who out of high school and they're dating a woman still in high school. I'm banning it. That's it. Chetty says no. Number eight, bedroom watch party. Okay, let me paint the scene for you. It's 2009, you just finished pre-drinking and watching the latest episode of Jersey Shore with your friends. There's enough hair product in your hair to keep a bowl of lime jello still. You slap on some Uggs and head to the club. You meet someone who's cute AF. Maybe it's the tequila, maybe it's the apple bottom jeans, but you wanna come home with this person. Instead of making it to your bedroom, a bathroom nightclub is now your domain for love. People walk by and witness your actions but you do not care because this is your life and it's 2009 and you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that, but medieval times. Yeah, it's not a nightclub, but people would just come into your bedroom to witness that you went through with it on the marriage. Nobody wants that. That's just weird, that's not normal. Come on in, me and my wife are about to, come on in. Number seven. The Hunger Games. In the not so common case of a woman trying to divorce her husband, because you know, she's most likely not being treated very well and she's just not allowed to divorce and it's really just a messy time for women. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Or you fight in combat to determine who wins the divorce. And by winning the divorce, I mean whoever wins lives, yes. This was something that was actually done in medieval Germany. Basically, there's a little arena. Husband gets put into a hole to make it fair, I guess. There's a sack of rocks and a club, and then you just full send it and start swinging at each other. I feel like most divorces suck. Not that I would know, I've never been married, but I mean, come on, are the married people really telling me at home right now that they wanna swing rocks and clubs at each other? <laughs> I don't think so. Number six, gross. Kangas Khan, maybe the most down bad dude to ever get on a horse and do what he did. Well, maybe except Arthur Morgan, but he's not real, even though I wish that chiseled, handsome, rugged man was. <sighs> Despite my daydreaming fantasies, I'm here to talk about a really bad dude, Kangas Khan, medieval conqueror and womanizer. He had so many wives, who a good portion of which were forced at sword point to be his wife, and husband and wives were not exactly sitting around the couch uh, watching news together back then. They, they did the deed, whether or not both partners signed off on it. What I'm getting at is he had so many offspring that his DNA is still with us today. 0.5% of the male population on Earth are descendants of the Mongol warrior. That's over 60 million dudes. That's just insane, bro. Number five, fear the dead. 
With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodie were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then, and only then, do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the fifth century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing Plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the Dancing Plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more. All moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult. Others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way, we're all dancing. At number 10, we have blowing your nose in public. We are starting off strong because this was far more absurd than even I could imagine. 
For it to make sense, we have to start from the beginning. In 12th century Newmarket, horse racing made its debut, but didn't become popular until the 16th century, which is when it really started to gain traction. And that was when many laws surrounding horses were put in place. In Newmarket particularly, it became really big for business. So there were lots of horses and they needed to be protected in order for them to race properly at full health. One of the laws that was put in place was being unable to blow your nose in public because they didn't want the horses getting sick. Not only was it blowing your nose, but if you exhibited any other symptoms of illness while in public, it could have resulted in mild trouble or a fine. They did not mess around with their horse's health. At number 9, we have the ordeals. Punishment in the Dark Ages, whether it be non-consensual chiropractics on the stretcher, or a hot pail and a couple of rats, it was seriously concerning. Well, up until 1215, if peasants were accused of a crime, they would have to go through an ordeal to prove their innocence. There were three different types of ordeals. There was ordeal by fire, where a person would carry a burning hot rod for three meters, then their wounds would be bandaged. They would sit and wait for three days, with the wound still bandaged, and when the bandage was removed, the state of the burn would determine whether or not they were innocent. If the burn was healing, they were innocent, and if they weren't healing, they were guilty. There was ordeal by water, which is where the accused person would be thrown into a body of water. If they floated, they were innocent, and if they didn't, they were guilty. The third ordeal was combat, where they would literally fight to prove their innocence, and if they didn't complete the trial, they were guilty. It was in 1215, where the jury system was introduced, which was far more humane, considering there was a lot of flaws in the ordeal process. At number 8, we have entering the House of Parliament armed. This practice began in the 13th century and was actually never abolished, so it is technically still active to this day. What happened was that Edward II had made a lot of people he was ruling very angry. So to avoid a peasant uprising with weapons and armor, and other things he couldn't fight back against himself, he enforced the law of being unable to enter the parliament building in armor or while armed, because that was considered a threat to a higher up, and it was a punishable offense. It was also punishable to enter the parliament building using force. So while the law itself has some logic behind it, it was put in place for all the wrong reasons. To protect a tyrant of a ruler, which makes no sense. At number 7, we have eating more than two courses. This one also has some logic to it, but still really makes no sense. In the Dark Ages, there were a lot of laws in place that determined what lower class townsfolk could and couldn't eat. This was put into place so the lower class couldn't resemble or live as lavishly as the upper class and royalty. It began in the mid 13th century and wasn't repealed until the mid 18th century. What the punishment was was unclear, and there are no documented punishments for the act, but it was heavily frowned upon. The details of the law were that a regular man could not eat an excessive amount of meats and dishes that nobles were eating. A man must be limited to two dishes, with the exceptions for holidays, like Christmas, where they were were allowed to have three courses. Something else to note is that soup was considered a full course meal and not just a sauce. So if you were having soup, you had to choose your second course wisely. Thankfully, we don't have any laws like that today, because that would make family events really awkward. At number 6, we have scheduled baby making. Fornication is part of a human's animal nature. It's how we all came to be. But in the Dark Ages, there were only specific and dedicated times when a couple was allowed to go at it, because of religious laws. They were only allowed to do the deed on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, because they were required to start preparing for the church services on Sunday, on Thursday. Saturday, it was allowed as well, but not everyone participated on the day because it was the in-between the preparation and the Lord's Day. Throughout the year, there were other lengths of time where it wasn't allowed, like the 47 to 62 days of Lent, which is in the spring, and the 35 days leading up to Christmas, December 25th, and the 40 to 60 days around the time of the Feast of the Pentecost. To make matters worse, women were not allowed to make eye contact with their husbands or any other man for that matter during these times, because eye contact was believed to be a temptation and was frowned upon during times when no action could be taken. And if she was caught making eye contact, she would have been punished for it, which in reality also makes no sense. Number five. 
groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool, though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the Dark Ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII, and this role was to assist the king, and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom o the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other, like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know? Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow remover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest, wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather, someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather, out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. 
Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG, historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10, beauty sleep. When you go to bed at night, ideally, you want eight hours. Me, personally, I'm lucky if I get like six. I don't know, I'm like a child. I'm restless at night. I'm kicking around, I'm making weird noises. It's insane, it's problematic. Maybe I should see someone. If this were medieval times, however, I'd be set. See, back in the dark ages, it was common to have two four-hour naps at night rather than one swift eight-hour slumber. See, many believe this was to tend to a fire or hopefully not a fire. You know, gotta wake up, make sure things aren't gone. It's medieval times, it was rough. You wake up, throw a log on, yawn, and then hop back into your pile of hay. I don't know, whatever they had back then. Good times. This system of waking up after four hours, it sounds like an unhealthy inconvenience, but in reality, historical accounts suggest that people in the dark ages generally slept for longer periods of time despite their sleep being interrupted by periods of wakefulness. They slept longer due to the fact that, you know, light bulbs didn't exist yet, so lava lamps weren't a thing, neither were alarm clocks. So people would often go to bed shortly after sunset and wake up with the sunrise, so that's a good rest. That's a good medieval rest. That's like 12 hours. Number nine, the Norse disappearance. I just watched the Norsemen. I'm gonna start barking at people now when I'm on the subway, just to, you know, get my old roots back, my old Norse roots. There are several theories regarding the disappearance of the Norse from Greenland during the Dark Ages, right? Where did they go? Where does a Norse Viking go? That's a little concerning. Where'd that guy go with the beard and the hatchet? That's a little important. One theory suggests that climate change played a significant role. The Little Ice Age, which began around the 14th century, that led to a decrease in temperature and a shorter growing season. Of course, making it difficult for the Norse to farm and raise livestock and, you know, have that big mighty beard and eat good. This could have resulted in a decline in food production, leading to famine and ultimately the collapse of Norse settlement. Another theory suggests that the North were on the North, the Norse, the North of the North. Another theory suggests that the Norse were unable to adapt to the harsh conditions of Greenland. The Norse were used to living in more temperate climates and the extreme conditions of Greenland could have been too difficult for them to endure. They're a little too hot for comfort. Finally, there's a theory that the Norse were driven out by the Inuit who had been migrating into Greenland around the same time as the North. So a little bit of a beef happened there, a little West Side Story with Vikings, if I may. The Inuit were skilled hunters and fishers, and their presence could have put pressure on the North Settlement, ergo war. But it's likely that the combination of these factors contributed to the disappearance of the North altogether, so exact reason, that's uh, still a mystery. I vote the Inuit though. There's probably some beef. There's probably some settlement beef. Number eight, green children of Woolpit. Now this one, this is a medieval story that tells the tale of two children who randomly appeared in the village of Woolpit in England, but they showed up with green skin and they spoke an unknown language. So aliens confirmed, for sure aliens. I wouldn't even open that door. The children were taken in by a nice local landowner and although they were initially very distressed and refused to eat any human foods, they eventually adapted to their new surroundings. Again, green children didn't speak English, aliens. Reminder. The boy eventually learned to speak English over time and he explained that he and his sister came from a land where the sun does not shine and everything was green. Yeah, it's like Avatar 3 going on. Something's going on out there. Sometimes the grass is greener on the other side, but sometimes the people are also green. That's fun. That's a fun little bit. Bunch of incredible hulks in a place where there's no sun. Sounds nice and warm and welcoming. Lovely. Let's find out more. The origins of the story, of course, remain a mystery with various interpretations ranging from folklore to my personal favorite, extraterrestrial encounters. Love aliens. Love that. Grew up watching signs. You tell me in the comments. Did this happen? Are these aliens? Were these just random children? Children? This is all bullshit. Who knows? Number seven, Shroud of Turin. The origins of the Shroud of Turin, a piece of cloth that bears the image of a um, one Jesus Christ, a crucified man, shrouded in mystery, it seems. According to tradition, the shroud was used to wrap the body of, again, one Jesus Christ after his crucifixion, and many Christians believe this right here to be the burial cloth of Christ. I pointed like I actually have it here. I don't have it here. I wish I did. That would be great. We get a lot of likes, but no, it's over there. However, its authenticity is the subject of ongoing debate, of course, because 
I mean, who really knows? The shroud first appeared in historical records in the 14th century, and it's been housed in Turin, Italy, since the late 16th century. Again, that's a pretty mighty piece of cloth right there. Next national treasure, Nicolas Cage has to grab that and put it in his pocket like a cowboy. Number six, John Cabot's fate. John Cabot, he was an Italian explorer who sailed under the English flag, and he's known for his voyages to North America in the late 15th century. His final voyage in 1497, this was intended to establish English trade and settlements in the New World. But Cabot, he set out with a small fleet of ships from Bristol, England, and he sailed along the eastern coast of North America. However, something happened. He encountered difficulties, I guess one could say, including rough weather and a mutiny among his crew, which is much worse than a storm, I would say. And his fate remains unknown to this day. That rhymed, Dr. Seuss, love it. Some historians believe that Cabot may have perished at sea, while others speculate that he may have made it back to England and then died there. So how did he go? Was he eaten? Who knows? Who really knows? And having a crappy kid sucks even more so back then than now because of the baby gamble. Choosing, if a woman got to choose, to have a baby was a hell of a decision in the dark ages. Plagues, famines, messed up weather, just not the environment for it. Let alone women being regarded as morally weak and they weren't allowed to do things that modern women take for granted. Like getting a job, deciding who to marry, having opinions, wearing pants. Your only two options were to become a nun or marriage. No work, no single living in the country. You get two options. And even if you weren't the most devoutedly religious, none was safer, if not a better option. Childbirth and pregnancies would kill one out of every three women in the dark ages. Compare that today's maternity morality rate as one out of every 0.028% of women. The fact that the female population now is significantly more equal in numbers to men in comparison, I think the choice is spectacularly easy. According to the Raven Report, childbirth in the Middle Ages and the Tudor period were so dangerous, royal women were encouraged to write out their last will and testament well in advance to giving birth. Just imagine adding that to the baby to-do list under decorate nursery and sew onesies. But on the flip side, some men weren't exactly capable of popping out babies, thus the impotence trials. Modern time has counseling, understanding doctors, and little blue pills. All sorts of resources to help men with that issue. But the Middle Ages? Whew, don't expect any real sympathy. Not from wives or the whole community. Conjugal duties are taken hella seriously. Partially because everyone was frisky and they're locked into having just one person for the rest of their life. And it wasn't just men who had the right to ask their partners to perform. Wives could also demand intimacy and failure to provide? Well, buddy, you're getting served. And many recorded cases of women being granted divorce due to their husband's infancy exist to prove it. And they were carried out in public. Whole Judge Judy style throwdowns to called impacy trials where accused man was expected to um, perform in front of the jury. To be granted a divorce, the woman had to prove her man was unable to perform, which wouldn't be shocking when you have an entire village watching with bated breath, even if it wasn't an issue before. Don't worry, a dude could save himself the shame of an annulment by calling on special witnesses such as working girls or other women from the past who could attest his manly prowess. Any medieval lady capable of putting her husband through such a humiliating ritual was almost always from a wealthy family. Lawyers and expert physicians didn't come cheap, but at the end of the day, men were literally able to cut our faces off in public or throw us in a fire alive for not baking bread right, so guys, I don't really think you can complain about this too much. Laws like this are one of the many stupid details that could have you randomly imprisoned. Another one, stingy stripes. Living in the dark ages is impossible for a lot of reasons, but having to keep track of hundreds of stingy laws to ensure you don't get locked up over a mistake truly was one of the hardest factors. What was the wrong way to pray? The wrong hair? A mole in the wrong spot? A color only the king can wear? Or how the simple act of wearing stripes could lead to your imprisonment or even death? Why? Because for some reason, striped clothing were seen as a garment of the devil. Thus, anyone caught wearing them would at best get an evil eye from people in the street or at worst get a hemp necktie. From the year 1250 onwards, the only people who were caught wearing stripes were the lowest of the low in society. Working girls, handicapped, the ill, the orphaned. They would don striped outfits highlighting their status as outsiders. In 1295, Pope Boniface issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. In the year 1310, in the French town of Rouen, for example, a local cobbler was condemned to death simply because he'd been caught wearing striped clothes. Crazily, even animals weren't exempt. Records show that zebras were called beasts of the devil, even though people in Europe had only ever heard reports of them and hadn't even seen one with their own eyes. You can see how these guys led to colonization, right? Ridiculous. With the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe, the hatred of stripes eased and eventually disappeared, and many look on the phenomenon with confusion, and understandably so. Time for the Shrek references. It's ogres and pitchforks. More specifically, just the pitchforks and less specific 
specifically, really just the farm tools in general. You guys know in the movies like Shrek when the villagers all come carrying pitchforks and farm tools and of all things, like why that and not swords? First of all, swords are heavy and who has that kicking around? Seriously. Secondly, noblemen could require all male peasants over the age of 18 to report for military service. Didn't matter if it was a justified war against a viable external threat or just a petty fight against a local rival. If you are called up for duty, you had to report. According to histories of the time, around one in five peasant men would be in a military service. Food and clean water were in short supply and disease was rife. Some historians reckon two thirds of all conscripted men who died were killed by unsanitary conditions of their own camps over any enemy action. But peasants were required to bring their own weapons. Moreover, they would rarely receive anything more than rudimentary training, so they're sent to war unprepared and ill-equipped. Thus the thought process, well, this tool works on my farm. For this, it'll work for that. So uh, what really sucked about military service in medieval times is how little was in for it for you. These days joining the military can be a way of learning a trade or generally improving your lot in life. Not so back then. Feudal lords were fearful of their peasants getting too powerful. So you're once a farmer, you're staying one. If a peasant soldier got too skillful on the field of battle, there were several cases of them ending up mysteriously dead. It's like getting a journalist of the year award from the CIA. And finally, it wasn't just living that was impossible, but death sucked too. All right, so evidently, whether from this video, others, or general universal knowledge, Dark Ages was pretty grim reality to live in. It's short, dirty, desolate, and brutal. But when it wasn't short, it was somehow worse. See, anyone over the age of 50, which was a crazy age achievement at the time, was deemed elderly. Unlike other cultures existing at the time, elderly in Europe are not even close to revered or respected. You didn't get to retire. Having to pay your own way and continuing to work until physically you simply couldn't. Then, yeah, after that, you're really just a burden. Your own kids are side-eyeing you and everyone's asking you why haven't you haven't died yet. What's the big hold up here, guys? For many, death was the only real chance to escape from everyday hardships or working the fields and trying to get enough money and food to survive. And when that finally happens and you pass through and rejoin the energies of our earth, you will finally find your peace. Yeah, no, psych, that still didn't happen. According to some research in Europe during the Middle Ages, mass of 40% of graves were disturbed. Now, this wasn't like grave robbing during the Enlightenment. There were no university medical schools paying good money for fresh corpses to study. Rather, most cases of grave disturbances were run-of-the-mill theft. Often people would be buried with a small selection of their possessions, perhaps a favorite cup, a locket, a stuffed animal toy, or other such trinkets. In tough times, even some dead person's mystery grave junk might be enough to tempt a broke thief to dig someone up. However, this wasn't always the case. There's some even weirder crap, too. Archaeologists in England have found evidence to suggest that in dozens upon dozens of quote grave robbing cases rather than looking for objects those responsible bound and gagged the dead bodies and then left them like that it seems like they're fearful of restless souls or perhaps of the undead rising again who knows they had a lot of problems back then number 10 naughty naughty there's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times we didn't know but now we do so there's really no excuse for acting up a very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You can be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. 
it was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially after you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell or spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding. And something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sounds just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey, Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Number five, the plague. Yes, we just lived through one of these. That's in the, isn't that neat? Can't wait to tell my kids about that one. Plagues are everywhere throughout history. Some are short, some are impossibly incredibly long. The bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348. Now the death toll here, it was devastating. I mean, we put up some crazy numbers in the last few years, don't get me wrong, but in the dark ages, the bubonic plague took out almost half of England's population. That's insane. They didn't even have Uber back then. You're like, how, how did that happen? Back Back then, the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Symptoms were jarring, to say the least. There were lumps in the armpits and or, um, you know, groin area. Not fun. Black spots would appear all over your body. It was uncomfortable. And it was noticeable, definitely to say the least, that you were plagued out. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever. Just randomly. Boom. Done. The drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. That's, uh, I guess, a bright side. Not really. Workers were demanding higher wages wages, farmers were demanding lower rents, and the poor got expendable income. Sounds a little familiar, dare I say. Number four, Greek fire. This one's absolutely crazy. Greek fire was a weapon used in medieval times. It was particularly used by the Byzantine Empire, and it was known for its ability to burn even when submerged in water. Yeah, almost like magic, some would say. Some scary, hot magic. The composition of Greek fire was a closely guarded secret, but it was known to be a highly flammable liquid that could be projected from tubes onto to enemy ships or soldiers. So yeah, they would just blast liquid lava at you. And then they're like, yeah, war's done, just like that. Like in Game of Thrones, where it's just green fire. It was kind of like that. Greek fire was often used in naval battles and set enemy ships ablaze in four minutes or less. And its use was a significant factor in the success of the Byzantine Navy. The exact ingredients and recipe for Greek fire, like I said, they have been lost to history. And its composition remains a subject of debate and speculation among historians. Let's hope we don't find this one. I don't know, let's find some fair Arrows, mummies, tombs, treasures, that's great. Some guy's like, oh, the recipe for liquid lava that we can shoot at people. Awesome, let's do it. Number three, the Vinland map. The Vinland map, this one's fun to all the toptographers, hortographers, toptographers, map people. This one's for all the map fans out there. The Vinland map is a medieval map that depicts parts of North America, including a region known as Vinland. Not to be confused with Vineland, that's pretty good. I, that's a fun one. Vinland is believed to have been visited by the Norse explorer, Leif Erikson, around the year 1000. Now, the map was first discovered in the 1950s, and it's believed to date back to the 15th century. Buster 
sometimes. I'm like, huh? however, its authenticity has been the subject of ongoing debate among scholars and historians because, you know, it's like Atlantis. Some have argued that the map is a forgery, while others believe that it's a genuine medieval artifact, like the Shroud of Turin with, you know, Jesus' selfie. This is amazing. I have to say, I believe this was once a real place. Sure, why not? The amount of pharaohs and leaders, dictators, all these people throughout history who lost in books that have been burnt. Of course, there are places and maps that have also been lost to history. Or maybe I've watched too many National Treasure movies. Could be, could be the latter. It's probably that too. Number two, the Dancing Plague. All right, this one's fun. Hit that like first. Step Up 2 fans. So it's gonna be real sick. July 15, 18, one of the most bizarre dance circle slash plague events, who knows really, in medieval history went down. It was the craziest dance circle all of history, I have to have to admit. The Dancing Plague. Yeah, why can't this be the plague that comes back now? Why, it had to be the one that was gross, everyone's coughing on each other. Why could we all just be popping and locking in the streets in 2020? Would have been way better. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and collect one summer, back in 1518, until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance, or convulse uncontrollably in the streets. Others soon joined her, which is the weird part, and eventually over 400 people were all dancing the days away, or convulsing, one of the two. It's really tragic. See, this was not a good time. It's, you know, we call it the dancing plague, like, oh, they were all dancing in the street. No, it was a nightmare. People are like seizing on the ground. Seizing? Seizing? People are seizing on the ground. It was tragic. A good amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion alone. The authorities, they tried their best to help out the situation. They uh, they paid for musicians to perform for them while they convulsed, which is just the thing you need back then. They're like, oh my god, what's happening? Quick. They just played music. They're like, this makes it way better. This is so fun now. No, it was horrible. Everyone was sick. This was a disease. This happened a few times in Europe, believe it or not, between the 14th and 17th centuries, and we still don't know what exactly happened. All we know is that it was some sort of illness and that it was not like Step Up 2. Apparently it was not sick, nor 3D, nothing like that. And finally, number one, no insults. This one here is great. This would change the game today. If we brought this one back, so good. I can't whistle, but It'd be like that. If you hurled insults at somebody back in medieval times, they were entitled to compensation and they could summon everyone else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, if you spoke bad of someone during the Viking Age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation. And because of that fact, you now need to pay them for the possible damages you caused with your words, with your sick, nasty words. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. The reputation was how you gained employment back then, how you met friends, and it was really important. It was an important thing not to be messed with. Also, if you insulted one man, apparently you insulted his entire family as well. So it's like that Vin Diesel kind of fast and furious families everything vibe where with one person, they're all coming at you. It was rough. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said it. I didn't want to know which words that was. Sometimes you went a little too far. Starting us off is cutting edge courtship, quite literally in this case. It was traditional in some Nordic countries to have courtship customs involving knives and daggers. This is due to sacrificial nature in their original belief. The purpose of a dagger is prevalent for that after all, but it was also due to its functionality. In Finland, when a girl came of age, her father let it be known that she was available for marriage by providing her with an empty sheath. The girl would wear an empty sheath attached to her girdle, skirt. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a pokoko knife in that sheath, which the girl would keep if she was interested in. If she wasn't, she could just toss that anywhere. The knives were often custom, so a man would be able to woo a woman with unique details and imagery on a blade, but could also offer an heirloom or traded blade. Seeing as women of the North Nordic region didn't shy away from handwork such as farming, jewelry making, clay working, etching, clothiers, and even some positions like smelting, a blade was a thoughtful and convenient gift that also said, I love you a whole dagger's worth. Something so romantic about giving someone a gift they could quite literally kill you with. In the meantime, while the scans are giving blades, the English are being taught the no-no days and the no-no ways. In layman's terms, they were being told how to have intercourse and when. That just doesn't make for a fun title. You may be familiar with these laws and regulations, they've come up in some of our other medieval and middle age videos. This was a time period where the church had a lot to say in state affairs. Not to say that it doesn't now, but they were able to make determinations such as intercourse schedules around the religion. Real laws were in place that people could not have sex on Sundays, Thursdays, or Fridays due to religious reasons. Whenever a holiday had a fasting period, such as Lent, abstinence was expected then as well. If anyone was to deviate from the set rules by having intercourse, they were committing a grave sin. These laws were written in penentials, which were books that indicated 
indicated what was allowed under the church rules and what was not. Oral, backdoor, premarital, and self-inflicted intercourse were banned in these books. Now thankfully their wide range taboos included some good stigmas to have such as interbreeding so that minimized people keeping it in the family and messing up our future populations. But even with sexual laws, men could be knaves, which is just an old timely way of saying being a dog. Now I'm not saying ladies couldn't have itchy feet and dog their way around too, we do it now and we've been doing it then, but it was a lot worse for ladies to be caught back then. So the general consensus is that it was rare and when it did happen it was usually affairs outside of a marriage. In general, young medieval daters had to be cautious, while peasant marriages were a little more than saying we're married most of the time, reputation, especially for a lady, was huge as was virginal status. Men of higher status often sought out beautiful peasant girls for affairs. Sometimes they benefited the woman greatly and she'd become an heir to a status child, thus elevating her own. But for the most part, it was pure carnal enjoyment men were after in a time when women were told to do the opposite. And so it became a game of men trying to win a single woman into doing the act. She had everything on the line while he usually had nothing. Secret flings were frowned upon to say the least and were often seen as a sign of potential trouble, hence the English ballad that would warn of knaves preying on young fair maidens at country fairs. A young woman caught having affairs was a wild scandal that could even be punished for or put to death, so making the decision to bow to a lord's or even a common man's pressure could quite literally destroy a woman's whole life and being. Yet it's still a decision women made. Ah, hormones. Yet when it comes to marriage, it's always love versus politics. Medieval marriages tended to be negotiations, particularly around dowry, but it wasn't all about money. It was very important that a noble woman is a virgin at marriage at purely out of pragmatic reasons. Marriage after all was an alliance union of two families that required healthy and admirable legitimate children to be truly locked in. It's for this reason as well as the violent men in society that the church law stated that the degree of pressure to encourage a marriage could not sway a constant man or woman, aka no forced consent. What was forced however was up to debate, so don't be too proud of them for having that law in place. A woman was able to call off her marriage up until it occurred for this reason, as was a man. Should this occur, dowry was either returned in full or only partially as a fee for the failed union. Alongside this was the courtly love direction romance and marriage began to take in the middle mid ages during a Shakespearean and theatrical influence. Marriage started to become idealized, we'll circle back to how this affected people later, but lower classes consistently did marry for love since there is little to be gained materially from marrying for them. For most part there was no official ceremony that the social level marriage was more like hey we're married now and living together. By 1400 AD there were actually many laws decreeing marriages needed to start becoming a public affair and one may wonder how often people did marry in secret. Next up watch lords try to impress ladies with a lance measuring contest. As mentioned courtly love and chivalry are important facets of medieval society and culture and seeing as tournaments and displays of masculinity were centerpieces of this culture it's no surprise it made its way into courting. By 12th century England tournaments were in full swing usually consisting of jousting and melees. A big organized throwdown between knights that were not expected to be dangerous but occasionally resulted in serious injury or death. These tournaments were respectable places to meet potential suitors and singles flocked to these spots to watch heroic knights joust and parade themselves around while noble maidens looked on adoringly. Some contemporary conservative commentators as well as the church however complained that the tournaments were places of frivolity, scandal and lust. Buzz kills. Don't worry if sword fighting isn't your to forte then poetry or songwriting were also popular ways to express your love to a lady. Number 5 Mamma Mia! The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you, or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number 4 Arranged Marriages All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promised daughters to others. 
Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number three, marital disputes. I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I have to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then. Till death do you part. And depending on if the church would even allow it. But however, in the yieldy times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's not you guys. You guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. Rome really had existed as nothing but a name by the time the empire falls on September 4th of 476, having been falling inwards on itself for just short of a century at that point. So started the periods between the 5th and the 15th centuries, known as the Middle Ages. This time can be split into three main sections, the Early Middle Ages, aka the Dark Ages, High Middle Ages, and Late Middle Ages. One of the most famous events from the entirety of the Middle Era was truly kicking some ass in the Dark Ages, and it was the Black Death. Something that nobody gets anymore, with exception for a cool 20,000 some odd people between 2000 and 2009, and 56 people in the United States in the last few years. But if we pretend that we don't know that, and if we can avoid chipmunks like the effing plague carrying hairbringers of death they are, then we most likely don't have to worry. But travel back in time, say, to the 800s or even 1340s Europe, and your chances of surviving are somewhere between 7 and 10 and 2 and 5. Black Death killed as much as 60% of the entire population of Europe. So when you're at work looking around but with those blank dead fish eyes bored, cross off every third person you see in a pattern of five and try to figure out how many of them are gone and who you'd manage without. Probably now being in a position to go, hey boss, looks like you need new middle management team and ain't since nobody left hooray promotion that's exactly what happened in the middle ages too after half the world died kind of changed the balance of power suddenly peasants could ask for pay raises and improvements in working conditions and life got a little better for them this was further developed by the evolution of feudalism and as a result the first banks and widespread money supply appeared for the first time in Europe RIP freedom hello capitalism and speaking of the workforce how about their dirty jobs night tosher rat catcher oh my there's no shortage of terrible jobs in the Dark Ages. So let's cover a few. So a leech collector was a woman's role. She was often living in the countryside near marshes and bogs, just generally dirty open water spots where she could strip her legs bare, grab a bucket, and wade into the mud, waiting for leeches to sucker themselves on. At that point, she could scrape the buggers off, bucket them, and then sell them in town to physicians, the wealthy people, beauty stores, whatever. Enjoy the scabs and infectious diseases. The groom of the stool was a position for the royal household who was in charge of cleaning the king's Badunkadunk, making sure it was clean and dry post his kingly, well, 
dumps. Tanning leather seems like it would just be hard. Don't worry, on top of stripping animal skin of its fur, soaking it, and consequently yourself in lots of lime and salt, it also involved animal feces. See, you'd hire this other guy who somehow had a worse job than you. He's called a pure collector. He'd collect you dog poop, you'd grab it with your bare hands and mush it into leather to treat it. And don't get started on lime burners or treadmill operators, which was essentially a 50-50 death sentence job. And usually whatever job you ended up with was one for life, because chances are you stay in one place. Many people dream of traveling. My generation especially is one that's opting out of children in order to do so. This isn't new, and the human desire to travel and learn is something inherent, coming with curiosity and the need to discover. But this wasn't one of those times. Written records show that a sizable proportion of people not only didn't travel to other countries, they never even left their region or the village they were born in. Even if you did manage to travel, it wasn't planes and annoying but passable airport waits. The average traveler would often sleep out in the open air. Inns or other forms of accommodation were few and far between, and usually too expensive for the typical person to afford. So aside from the super fun chance of freezing to death overnight, travelers in the Middle Ages also had to worry about being robbed or attacked on the road. Many people therefore chose to travel in groups, but even then you weren't entirely safe. Your homies could turn on you at any second. Consider also that roads and pathways were rough, and this was a ridiculous era where even spraining an ankle could prove to be fatal. Then there's finally bridges, which are quite rare, especially outside of big cities. So you might have to cross rivers manually, and while they could memorize and recite Latin every day, these dummies couldn't swim. Drowning was all too commonplace, even the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I died while attempting to cross a river. So if you're gonna live in one region, one city, and one house your whole life, naturally it would be a dingy shack. Because peasants' homes were small, often just made up of one room. They were constructed of wattle and daub, a type of method of constructing walls, in which vertical wooden stakes, or wattles, are woven with horizontal twigs and branches, and then daubed with clay or mud. Then they'd have a thatched roof to boot. And if they're well constructed, these bad boys could be waterproof and stand for a decent amount of time. But they required upkeep, and not everyone can afford that, especially seeing as it's essentially paper mache twigs and mud, you really had to stay on top of this. Inside of a hut, a third of the air Area was penned off for animals which lived inside with the family. I know people that complain about the smell of a cat litter box. My guy, you could have had a whole donkey living next to the kitchen sink. Chickens, cows, pigs. Then to really complement the mildew smell of rotting roof and the stink of sweat and feces covered animals, a fire burned in the hearth in the center of the hut so that the air was permanently eye-wateringly smoky. Furniture was maybe a couple stools, a trunk and bedding, and a few cooking pots. Beds were a thing, but they weren't very great. And don't forget a couple of dirty chamber pots kicking around the room. We may have discovered a new homing style, you guys. We could call it medieval open conceptualism with minimalism aesthetic. And when it's time to get your kid out of the house, you hook them up with an apprenticeship. The freaky Greekies weren't the only ones tossing their kids at other adults saying, here, take this and raise it. However, unlike the Greek apprenticeship, which came with some strings attached, as explained in the recent top 10 reasons why living in ancient Greece was impossible video, the dark age apprenticeship was truly and solely about work. But nobody said it was good or fair work. From the midpoint of the Middle Ages onward, master craftsmen were permitted to employ youngsters for free so long as they provided them with food, lodging, and formal training in their specific craft, which would undoubtedly elevate their status in this society. But getting through an apprenticeship was hard as hell. First, nobody said the food had to be quality, so rations often sucked and apprentices could effectively starve. But then there was the fact you could just get beat up by your master at any time, because it was literally expected of them to do that. Why? Because apprenticeships were ways of parents to get crappy, troublesome teens out of the house and learn some discipline in society. To add insult to injury, apprentices were stuck between childhood and adulthood by being teens. Because on one hand, a teen in medieval times would have been treated as an adult. On the other hand, privileges of adulthood, like the right to inherit money or ownership of land, didn't come into play until around age 21. So you're expected to be an adult, treated like a kid. Small wonder then that the tales of apprentices misbehaving badly are a staple of written accounts from the Middle Ages. Rather than dedicating themselves to their professional development, apprentices would often be found in pubs and brothels. Normal middle-aged teen activity. At number five, bear leader. Now here's a really strange job from the Middle Ages, which sounds both terrifying but also kind of cool. Back in the Middle Ages, blood sports were all the rage. Many of the monarchs who ruled during this time were obsessed with watching blood sports, which honestly kind of explains a lot, but that's besides the point. One of the most popular blood sports was bear baiting, which involved making a pack of dogs fight a bear. 
sounds gruesome, but it also begs the question, well, where did you get the bear? Well, that's where bear leaders came into play. For bear leaders, their whole job was to lead bears from village to village so that they could participate in blood sports. Now it sounds super dangerous because, well, we're talking about a big bear, but imagine how much of a flex that would be to say, yeah, I wrangle bears for a living. Like, how cool would that be? Now that's something to put in your Tinder bio. And number four, the piss prophet. As we all know, medicine wasn't all that advanced in the Middle Ages. There were no actual doctors, and the people you would have visited if you were feeling unwell were the same people who doubled as barbers, so I don't know how accurate their medical diagnosis would be. In medieval England, people didn't really know much about health, and many people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. The people who collected people's urine samples were called piss prophets, and they had their own criteria for determining what was going on in someone's body based on their urine. According to the piss prophets, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then it meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were because medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. And number three, muckraker. In our last video about unusual jobs from the Middle Ages, I told you guys about a job where people had to clean up human waste with ladles and then transport it elsewhere to keep the town clean. But there's another profession along those same kind of lines that I'd like to tell you about. Muckrakers were the people who were responsible for cleaning waste off the streets in whatever town they were in. You see, back then, people kind of just disposed of their waste wherever they pleased. But since this waste, like human and animal excrement, rotting food, and entrails had nowhere to go and kind of just sat around the streets, you can just imagine how disgusting that must have been. So that's where muckrakers came in. These were brave people who basically rode around town, collecting waste off the ground and throwing it into carts to then be transported out of the city. As horrible as this job may sound though, these people actually made a lot of money. Muckrakers could make in 11 days the same amount as another laborer makes in 6 months. Would you do this job if it made you rich? And number 2, Arming Squires. I've talked about squires in a previous list about medieval knights, and if you've watched that video, then you might be familiar with how unpleasant the life of a squire could be. At a certain point in their training, a squire would be tasked with basically being an assistant to a knight, and a lot of their assistance was guided towards the knight's armor and weaponry. In the Middle Ages, arming squires were given the task of maintaining the knight's armor. So this meant that they had to make sure that the armor was clean and properly attached to the knight's body. This job was so serious that sometimes the arming squire would have to run out into the battlefield in the middle of a fight to tend to their knight's armor, which meant that they were risking their lives for a couple hunks of metal. And finally, at number one, peer finders. Now I think this last job on our list must be one of the worst ones by far. We've talked about how people harvested leeches, cleaned waste off the streets, and stomped on urine-soaked wool, but imagine if your job was just to go around the town and pick up as much dog poop as you possibly could. This was basically what people called peer finders would do. Dog poop was essentially used as a drying agent by tanneries to make leather for bookbinding. This was a lot of people's full-time jobs, but imagine how crappy this job would have been. Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man, trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different 
different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. That being said, the family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well-known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de' Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which, if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They used money and power to manipulate, and they got their way. Number four, diaper sniper. All right. This one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious, lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in the oldie times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. 
Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity. But I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Number three, dyslexia for cure found. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10, and that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart. They might overthrow you after all. And sorry, ladies. Ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs, no girls allowed. The richest of families could have their son sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. I'm assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? Number two, do you require a bowel movement, sir? Kings will be kings, and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty, or really just a bowl, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact. Which, I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh. Number one, dead end job. Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaving a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law, and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kinda sucks though. Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings of the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing, and because of their social status, a lot of them lived lonely lives. At number 10, Groom of the Stool. There were a lot of really horrible jobs back in the Middle Ages. I mean, these people literally took any task you could think of and turned it into an actual profession. From fetching water from the nearest stream to handing drinks to people, everyone had some kind of job. But with that said, some jobs were worse than others, and here's one of them. The Groom of the Stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry a commode around at all times, waiting for the king to do his business, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have to, quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. You know you're well off when you hire someone just to take care of your bodily business. Talk about a crappy job. At number nine, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, one of the biggest threats that people of royal or high status had to worry about was being taken out by their enemies. Monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies as it was one of the most common methods of offing someone. So they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. 
The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed every morning. They would kiss the pillows, the sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning his clothes too, as well as his sons, and so they would be tested for poison before they got dressed. Henry VIII was really out here providing employment for just about every weird task you could think of. Before we carry on talking about some of the strangest professions from back in the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Leech Collector. Back in the Middle Ages, things were still quite underdeveloped, like medicine for example. In our last video, I told you guys about alchemists who, at the time, were pretty much the ones who sought out cures for different ailments. Because science wasn't really known to them back then, they tried using whatever they could find to create cures, and one of the most common things that were used in medicine were leeches. Now, as we've learned by now, anything could become a job in the Middle Ages, and so gathering leeches became a profession. What's even weirder than the fact that finding leeches was someone's job is the method of how they collected those bad boys. Leech collectors would wade into the water with bare legs and wait for the leeches to come to them. They would swish around and try to gather as many leeches on their body as possible. They would then get out of the water and pry the leeches off, putting them into a bucket and selling them to people in town like barber surgeons and other medical professionals. Now I can't say I've ever had a leech on me, so I don't really know what it feels like, but I can imagine that it's an uncomfortable feeling, so to have a bunch of them all over you must have been a nightmare. At number 7, Fuller. Wool was a very important part of life for people back in the Middle Ages. They were able to make all sorts of things out of it, and because it was waterproof because of the natural oils in the wool, it made processing the wool quite easy. But soon people found out that whatever they made out of the wool ended up being quite coarse and frayed easily. They figured that if they removed the oil from the wool, then it would make the overall product a little nicer, which it did, but the oil removing process definitely wasn't pleasant. Back then, in order to get the oils off wool, people called fullers would process the wool by pouring stale urine over it and then stomping on it. They needed some kind of alkaline solution to dissolve the oils and urine was the best and most abundant solution. What makes this extra gross though is the fact that when it came to big batches of wool, they would have needed the urine of a bunch of people to get the job done. So that means that the fuller would have been sloshing around in the urine of like half the town. Gross. At number 6, Ostiary. In the Middle Ages, religion played a big part in the lives of the people, and there were actually quite a few jobs centered around having something to do with the church. This is true with Ostiaries, who worked almost like a secretary for the church. This position was normally held by a man who wanted to move up in the church's hierarchy. He was basically doing a menial task to butt kiss his way to the top. Ostiaries were tasked with being kind of like a church bouncer. They would make sure that unbaptized people didn't come into the church during certain times, and they would also man the doors during baptisms. This profession was based on the Roman habit of having a slave guard the doors of their master's house. At number 5, Gong Farmer. Now even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically, and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits, and so they would be given a large ladle, and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been, and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare, so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. 
Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cupbearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it, just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cupbearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the ale wife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages, pretty dark. Also, after these epic messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A Lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the dark ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the dark ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plague souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights and you know the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. 
Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a night and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court, like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage apparently but instead of just you know setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever they just took them to court a real court like a real trial there was a judge a couple prosecutors eight witnesses a defense attorney for the pigs which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that that's a t terrible job that's one of the worst jobs ever I, I lightly introduced here these pigs were then hung from a gallows tree it was so horrible the dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just Eh, moving through towns, like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense. So it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go, just show up and fart and be funny. How about this land? That's like a kingdom, you have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. And remember, when meeting a beloved, dress to impress, but not so much that you cause a scandal. Remember, sumptuary laws exist. It'd be pretty embarrassing to be arrested and sentenced on your first date with someone. It was advised that medieval women getting ready for a date should wear their tallest steeple hat and their best dress, and top it off with their finest linen wimple. This helped to elongate the neck. A long neck on a woman was considered beautiful. So was a bunch of other weird stuff that we'll get to in a second. Meanwhile, men should always remember on a date to wear their best gown and hose which are pantyhose. But as said, don't dress too posh. The sumptuary laws of medieval England, such as the statute concerning diet and apparel of 1363, tried to ensure that citizens did not dress or consume above their social status. These rules included what kind of fur trims could be worn and by whom, colors, hats, patterns, shoes, and all the whole shebang. Check out our video, Top 10 Unusual Medieval Laws You Never Knew Existed, to learn more about sumptuary laws and laws of fashion. The rules of etiquette will most definitely help you avoid scandal when invited over to the family, home of your potential lover and they were genuinely as follows one keep your hands clean don't stroke the dog or the cat be sure to wipe your fingers on the tablecloth instead of licking them two bones are not to be gnawed and don't pick your teeth with the sharp irons three don't eat with a fork forks were used to prepare food but most medieval Europeans thought forks were an odd thing to eat with four don't eat with a knife either many people carried the knives on them on their belt to carve up the food before eating but don't eat with it five okay if it's a liquid use a spoon 
people tended to eat with their hands for everything else. Six, don't sit too close to the salt cellar. Salt was expensive and associated with prestige, so it's a good dating tip at a big dinner to see who sat closest to the salt cellar. And seven, you can burp, but look up at the ceiling as you do so, and eight, remember you must not urinate at the host's premises unless you're staying overnight and it's before bed. Obviously some of these things like wiping your hands on a tablecloth, eating without a knife, or holding your pee until it's time to go are pretty unusual to us now. But back in the middle ages, if you wanted that shorty and not to ruin your reputation, well, you're burping at the ceiling, bro. I hope she's worth it. Next up is how love makes you crazy. This is a fascinating wormhole to travel down, and I learned from several journal articles that lovers in the middle ages had a real tendency to go mad. I mean, we all know the examples. Elaine, the fair maid of Astrolot pining away. Romeo and Juliet taking their lives, and the raving madness of Ophelia. But these are just dramatizations, right? We tend to regard accounts of love madness in medieval literature as evidence that they overestimated the strength of erotic passion. In classical and early medieval periods, sexual love was regarded as carnal appetite to be controlled. But with the rise of poetry sentiment and the theater came courtly love, which was seen as a highly spiritual desire. The idea of courtly love had more to do with the concept of loving rather than pleasure. This idealized kind of love was based on a secret union where two lovers could only love from far away. These sorts of unattainable relationships were increasingly romanticized, but in medieval society, the notion that erotic love could drive people mad may not be so unrealistic. We understand now that mental illnesses are sometimes provoked by the stress between the individual and their social environment. Think of the pressure a woman had to marry. Her whole life is purely based on existing for marriage and childbirth. The headspace created would be incredibly vulnerable to valuing all self-worth off of said marriage. If she had no suitors or faces rejection and begins to start aging out of normal marrying age, these could be detrimental to her mind. Mental illness existed in the past. This level of self-worth being carried by societal pressure that also will punish a woman for her sexuality or existence of it should it be perceived as sinful or unwomanly is unbelievably stressful. So yeah, women primarily would literally be driven insane by marriage and their value being tied up in it. But it's okay to be crazy as long as you're hot. So let's follow these medieval beauty tips. These are actually documented tips I rounded up. So let's run through the list. First, pluck your eyebrows and move your hairline back. A high forehead was considered attractive. One hair removal recipe was a vinegar mixture with ant eggs and ivy. Yum. Second, cancel all your Mediterranean trips. You need to whiten your face. Paleness was considered beautiful, and to achieve this, some women would apply mixtures to their skin, such as white lead powder mixed with sheep's fat. Weird. Third, while you're at it, hide those birthmarks and moles with homemade concealer. These blemishes were sometimes associated with witches in the Middle Ages. You may know this from our top 10 unspeakable things women went through in the Dark Ages video. One popular concoction was a face mask of bulls or hare's blood. Fourth, brunette is boring. Go blonde with organic hair dye. Flaxen hair for women was considered the most beautiful. Women who were not blonde could try a hair dye made from stale sheep's urine and saffron. If word of mouth wasn't enough to get these beauty tips to you, rest assured, Daniel of Beckles wrote a popular 13th century etiquette book. Regarding appearance, he said a man's hair should be neatly styled with a beard that was neither long nor shaggy and nails should be attractive and teeth should be kept clean. How do you keep your teeth clean? One recipe for teeth cleaning in the Middle Ages was to mix sage leaves with salt, roll into balls, bake them into a powder, and then rub them on the teeth. Sage advice indeed. And if you do not want to be a scandalous unmarried spinster, you better listen to it. And last but not least, don't forget to bring the hemlock. Whether you're two dirty knaves trying to get down lawlessly, or a married couple who didn't want kids, hemlock was your best friend. So yes, while the medieval church made it clear that sex outside and for some clerics inside of marriage was sinful, the literary and documentary evidence suggests that these medieval Brits were still finding ways to be as randy as rabbits without an illegitimacy scandal. It was Hemlock, a recommendation made by 13th century author Peter of Spain in his book Treasure of the Poor. Peter wrote men should rub boiled paste of Hemlock on their boys before intercourse. Seeing as Hemlock is poisonous, this was ballsy. Obviously they were open to whatever suggestions they could get. When Persian physician Abba BMZ Razi works was translated, Europeans gobbled up his suggestions, which was applying cedar oil onto the nether regions before intercourse for a man or after for the woman. He also said that if the woman jumps backwards after intercourse, the uh, stuff will fall out. Seeing intercourse before marriage itself was illegal and knavery was perceived the way it was, I'm sure I don't need to explain the scandal in this one. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as de Verdun was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, 
all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make Make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight. Stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, they're backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I, that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, AKA feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these 
extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA, the landowner, aka your landlord, allowing vassals, aka tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain in good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. At number five, beavers. Remember a little while ago when I mentioned the medieval practices of Lent and how they ate dolphins because they thought they were fish? Well, we have another animal that is most definitely not a fish, but medieval people believed that it was. Beavers. Yeah, beavers. They thought that because beavers were such good swimmers that they just had to be some kind of fish and were therefore suitable to eat during Lent. Originally, it was just the tail of the beaver that was suitable for Lent because it was considered cold, but later on they figured that the whole animal was good to eat because again, they thought it was a fish. I can't really see how they looked at this furry animal and thought to themselves, ah yes, a fine sea dwelling fish. But hey, these people believed in witches, unicorns, and regularly put animals like pigs and donkeys on trial, so there you go. At number four, singing chicken. Continuing on with another insanely weird food from the medieval age, we have one that was pretty dangerous to eat, though the people who lived back then probably didn't know it was so unsafe. Back then, some chefs would prepare a pretty theatrical dish and called it singing chicken. Man, the things that they did to these poor chickens. Anyways, singing chicken was prepared by taking the chicken's neck and tying it with quicksilver and sulfur, and when the bird was heated, it made a sound like it was singing. Why this was necessary? Who the heck knows? There were other versions of these kinds of theatrical meals as well, where swans, pigs, and even fish were made to look like it was breathing fire. Chefs would soak cotton in alcohol and place it inside the animal, and when it was time to serve, they would light the cotton on fire and make the food look like it was some kind of dragon. At number three, roasted swan. A lot of people see swans as beautiful creatures. I mean, I see them as deceptive geese because even though they are pretty, they will still attack you and eat your young, but I digress. Though swans are a lot of people's favorite animals, in medieval times, swans were more so people's favorite food. Yeah, even the swans weren't safe from being devoured. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, since it's a bird, it's probably prepared in a normal way. And to those people, I say, have you been paying attention at all? Nothing was normal back then, and of course they had to make things weird. There were two ways of preparing a swan. The weird way, and the strange way. The first way of preparing the swan was to mince the entrails of a boiled swan with bread, ginger, and blood, and then mix it with vinegar. Yum. And the second way was to cut the bird open, remove its skin, roast it on a spit, and then reclothe it with its skin and feathers and present it to eager guests. Sounds absolutely horrible. At number two, lamprey. Imagine this, a gross, slithery eel with gray scaly skin and a suction cup-like face full of tiny, sharp teeth. Does that sound tasty to you? Because I can't say it does. However, to people in the medieval age, apparently it was finger licking good because this lamprey was all the rage and was actually a favorite of King Henry I of England who was actually said to have died from eating too many lamprey. Lamprey was considered a delicacy and was often enjoyed with a side of hot sauce. I don't care how it's prepared, you cannot catch me eating a sharp tooth worm of the sea. And finally, at number one, live food. I think that by now we understand that medieval cuisine was as much about theatrics as it was about sustenance. Between singing chickens, fire breathing fish, and cock and trices, a lot was happening in the kitchens back then, but by far the weirdest food trend from the medieval age was their live food shows. Because a lot of people loved a good show, chefs came up with a new idea to wow their dinner guests where they would serve an animal that looked to be dead and cooked, only for it to get up and run away when it got to the table. The most common animal used for these theatrics was of course the chicken. To prepare this unorthodox dish, the chef would take the animal, let's use the chicken as an example, and they would pluck it while it was still alive and glaze it to make it look like it had been cooked. They would then wait until the chicken fell asleep in the kitchen and bring it out on a platter. However, just as the chicken was about to be carved up and served, it would wake up and run down the table creating a chaotic dinner. Another common live food that would be served was frog pie. Chefs would put frogs 
in a pie, and then when the top of the pie was cut open, the frogs would jump out and startle the dinner guests. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water Water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number nine, town crier. I'm sure you've heard of the town crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the town crier, you might also think of the famous hear ye, hear ye that is associated with the speeches of the town criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the town crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The town crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye, hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye, 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 which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs, though, was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number seven, Reeve. These days, we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that, and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator, and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor, as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord, and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number six, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case-by-case -case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. Number five, the bedroom trial. So 
divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened, you had to do it, even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So so if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package, well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paper paperwork side of things, but once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's right. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's right was something even more horrific. The droit de seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now, just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village, even if they didn't want to get married. It was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the rite of the first night or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it 
or I do it. The Doigt de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirmed that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number 9, Dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me, for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum either in assets or money to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number 8, Shotgun Wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, then people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number seven, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flesh out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, Accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would've saved a lot of heartbreak, hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number 6, 
Shoes! Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now, this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever, so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and i whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around, and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person, and still in the punishment, begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top, or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? Number 10, farming. 
In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time. Or farming fran time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France. It was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although I certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserved, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed, had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. 
beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brushed with a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him. He's a chef. He said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God, and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then. Seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed, staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible, and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks, and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry, sister. I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now. Ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Bosque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artist. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I, didn't, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. At number 10, Roast Hedgehog. Hedgehogs, am I right? They're cute little spiky balls of fun and they make pretty good pets too. They're so cute that you would never want anything bad to happen to them, right? Well, if you lived in the medieval ages, you might beg to differ because while today we see hedgehogs as these lovable little creatures, back then they were nothing but something to feed your family for dinner. Sorry to anyone who owns a hedgehog. Yeah, hedgehogs were a delicacy back then and there's even a record of a common recipe for them. In the olden days when someone was looking to cook up a hedgehog for dinner, you would first have to unalive it and then gut it, tie it up, and wrap it in pastry. Apparently, if your hedgehog wouldn't unroll after it was uh, taken out, so to speak, you would just have to simply boil it in water and continue the preparation process. Apparently, back then, it was believed that eating hedgehogs helped with medical conditions like throat inflammation and leprosy. Not really sure how effective that was, but it was still a thing. At number nine, porpoise pottage. During Lent, people weren't allowed to eat meat. Normally, people would substitute 
substitute fish into their diet during this time, but if you were one of the wealthy, then you could treat yourself to something a little more extravagant than just plain old fish. For those who could afford it, they would sit down to a seafood feast, and they really ate anything that came out of the sea. We're talking fish, lobster, crabs, eels, and dolphins. Yeah, they thought that dolphins were fish and so safe to eat during Lent. In a recipe book from 1399 written by King Richard II's cooks, there was a recipe for porpoise fermentry, which was basically a sweet and spicy wheat porridge with dolphin on top. It consisted of almond milk and saffron and just sounds absolutely vile. I couldn't imagine what a dolphin would even taste like, but I wouldn't imagine that it would taste very good, especially with almond milk, wheat, and saffron. But would you guys try it? Now before I carry on telling you guys about the weird things that people ate in medieval times, I would first like to take a moment to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number eight, garbage. Ever heard of a garbage plate? It's a dish that originated in Rochester, New York, and it is a big plate of things like macaroni salad, baked beans, french fries, and a bunch of other things. Well, in medieval times, they also sort of had their own garbage plate, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound nearly as good as the one from Rochester. Their garbage was pretty foul, and honestly, I don't think that you could pay me enough to sit down and eat this thing. As the name dictates, garbage was made of, well, garbage. Anything that wasn't used in other dishes was basically thrown into a pot, cooked up some seasonings, hopes, and dreams. Even the recipe sounds gross, dude. In an excerpt from a medieval cookbook, to prepare garbage, it says to quote, take good giblets, aka the garbage, chicken heads, feet, livers, gizzards, and wash them all clean. Throw them into a nice pot and add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, and sage chopped small. Then take bread, steep it in the same broth, draw through a strainer, add and let it boil till done. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which was sour grape or apple juice, salt, and a little saffron, and serve it forth." End quote. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass on that one, thank you. At number seven, cock and trice. When living in medieval times, people had to be very creative when it came to cooking. You had to create flavors with limited resources while also trying to dodge the risk of poisoning people if you're not careful, but this next dish pushed the boundaries of culinary art so much that Gordon Ramsay would have to call every chef who made this an idiot sandwich. Back in medieval times, some chefs would prepare a dish called cock and trice, and it was kind of a monstrosity. This imaginative dish was made by combining a pig and a chicken into some kind of revolutionary Frankenstein's monster. Essentially, this dish was made by cooking a pig and a chicken, and then the chef would cut both animals in half, and then attach the front half of a pig to the rear half of a chicken. Then it would be stuffed and roasted on a spit, glazed in egg yolks and saffron, and topped with a gold leaf before being served to an elite like a king or queen. There was also an alternative version of this dish where instead of having the two halves of the animal mashed together, it would instead have the chicken riding the pig, and some chefs would even adorn the chicken with a knight's helmet for some extra pizzazz. Not sure why this was invented, but it certainly is creative to say the least. At uh, number six, Roasted cat. We started off this list talking about one common household pet that was traditionally eaten in medieval times, but now we have another, so for anyone who has a feline friend, you might want to skip this part. Roasted cat was yet another bizarre food that was eaten back in the olden days, and I can't really say I'm all that surprised. I mean, they were eating hedgehogs, dolphins, and garbage, so I wouldn't put it past them to take a bite out of Garfield too. Roasted cat was a pretty straightforward dish. They would just marinate it and roast it like they would any other kind of animal. But what makes this dish strange, other than the fact that it's a cat, was the way that it was prepared, and the superstition behind it. Cats already have a lot of superstition behind them, so it makes sense that in medieval times they believed all sorts of things about felines, but when it came to cooking them, it was believed that cutting the head off before cooking it was a vital step because, quote, it is not for eating, for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. End quote. So yeah, don't go eating cat brains, I guess. Number five, the moss. I ain't gonna come in here and tell you I know what it's like to be a woman or pretend I understand. There's been lots of great photos of humans that have been taken throughout history, but one that we miss for sure is when I was a kid and I learned what happens to women on those special couple of days of every month. Not shock, just confusion. The look on my face, it was it was priceless. I wish I wish y'all could have seen it. We got things mostly figured out now though, but think about the past. Medieval times, not an understanding time for ladies. There were just no products to help in that scenario. So 
Have you ever wondered what they did? I did, weird thing to think I guess, but oh well. Moss pads, yeah. Take some moss, you wrap it up in a cloth, bada bing, bada boom, now you're in business. Which actually is really smart when you think about it. I never would have thought of that, but that's, I'm a dude, so I, would, I wouldn't think about that. I just don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think about those big thinking thoughts and things sometimes. I'm just a big dumb guy. Number four, witch hunt. This is also a time where if a woman speaks out of line or does something to upset the feng shui of things, there's a good chance she will get labeled a witch and burned at the stake. This was becoming an issue because, well, it was becoming a witch hunt, meaning anything that was slightly not cool or basically anything people feared or disliked could be labeled witchcraft, and thus likely an innocent woman would be burned at the stake. I mean, it sounds like they had it down to a science, really. Woman does something crazy, will bring out the charcoal briquettes. No, no, see, that's that's not right. It's not like they could have done this amazing thing called investigate. You know, see if the woman was actually innocent or the claim that she was a witch because she wants to be paid a fair wage like a man. Mm, that really sound like witchcraft to me. Maybe don't be so hasty to bust out the pitch and torches. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Number three, you gotta do what you gotta do. I know what it's like to be down on your luck. Trust me, it sucks, it's not fun, but you budget. Save and work hard. You'll be back in the black before you know it. Women of medieval times got up and went to work. The kind of work a lot of women were forced to do because of circumstances. The oldest profession in the book, selling booty. It's been happening since day one and it won't be going anywhere soon. Now, I'm not here to condemn that kind of work. And funny enough, in medieval times, it was considered to be an actual profession. I just feel if you're gonna be in that line of work, it should be your choice. I'm a Las Vegas kind of guy. I love gambling, boozing, and the freedom to do what you want after strolling out of a casino after too much drinking and gambling. If you know what I mean. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to make the bread, and they just had to do what they had to do. And that's it. Number two, Hell Hath No Fury. Princess Olga of Kiev was a prime example of Hell Hath No Fury like a woman scorned. Long story short, her husband was torn apart by trees. Some gruesome stuff. It was actually, if you're looking, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So like the Sith on its worst behavior, she plotted her revenge. When 20 men she deemed were all responsible for her husband's passing were coming into town, she had a large ditch dug where they were buried alive. That is that is so heinous, I, I can't even. She then extended a welcome to more of the men responsible. When they arrived, she invited them to wash up in her bathhouse where she had the doors locked and the place torched, like it was a witch hunt or something. Just had them cooked, just threw, just cooked them up. Just, but I mean, they, they burn women, so why not? Why not cook some dudes? Uh, okay. Number one, honestly, who throws a shoe? If you've ever been to a wedding, then you've probably seen the bride throw a bouquet of flowers to waiting bridesmaids and other lucky ladies. Because the lady who catches the flowers is the next woman to be swept off her feet and to be married. Put a ring on it. Kind of ending on a wholesome note here, which is kind of nice, but it's still a, a little messed up. Hear me out. In medieval times, it wasn't flowers. It was shoes. At first, it doesn't seem so bad, right? Shoes. We'll throw some shoes around. Why not? Besides, you know, the, the shoe being thrown too hard. You wouldn't want to catch a loafer on the side of the head. That, that would hurt. I I think we forget how filthy our shoes can be. I mean, they walk through everything, dirt, mud, blood, and if you're in medieval times, having a good old fashioned wedding in the village probably meant some manure. Eesh. Well, I'm all about tradition, but maybe we could throw the flowers instead. They just smell better, and you know, there's just there's less poop. 